Uh, okay, uh, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to the Jewish Historical Institute online. Uh, today we have a special event. Uh, we have an event of releasing a publication, a, a Polish publication of Nathan's Drew uh, memoir, The Counterfeit Poles. This is a publication by Jewish Historical Institute and thanks to the financial uh, support by Drew family and we have a, a special guest today uh, Jerry Drew who is a who is son of, of uh, Nathan Drew and he will tell us today more about the memoir and uh, family history and he will be uh, talking from New York so welcome and from the other side of the ocean, here in Warsaw, we have Anna Jaroszuk, who is a, um, a managing, managing editor of the, of the book uh, from the Jewish Historical Institute. And we have Professor Andrzej Zbikowski, a head research yeah. department uh, of uh, JHY. And he is an editor of the memoir and accounts of uh, a series of, of Jewish Historical Institute publishing uh, press. So, um, Good welcome. Evening, good morning. Good morning, yes. In New York, it's uh, good afternoon. It's 5, uh, 1 p.m. Uh, we in Warsaw have 6 p.m. And just uh, before you start, I just wanted to say, um, uh, some uh, technical issues after after the um, interview after the talk there will be time for you all the audience to ask questions and uh, it will be through preferably through the, through chat and uh, you can write down your uh, questions uh, if you can see, there is uh, on the right hand bottom, there is a place to to write a question. So, so don't hesitate to to do it, and I will help to uh, organize it. So, I give voice to to you, dear guests. Thank you. Good well, first of all, I want to... uh, yeah, please, Jerry, uh, start. So I just want to thank all of you for the effort you've gone through in publishing my father's memoir and of course having me on today to discuss it uh, really makes our family very very proud thank you jerry uh, i would like to welcome everyone and uh, good afternoon and good evening uh, to everyone in warsaw in uh, usa and all over the world uh, Tomorrow night and afternoon, uh, we'd like to discuss about our the newest book uh, of our publishing uh, house. Uh, this is the, the very new book uh, of our publishing house because it uh, it has uh, came today uh, to, to us. This is the book. I have it already. Uh, and we are very glad uh, to present uh, this uh, memoir uh, and uh, with Professor Zbikowski and Jerry Dress, uh, we'd like to um, talk tonight uh, about uh, the story of the diary itself. Uh, just in a few seconds I will tell a little bit of uh, this book and uh, to present it, uh, firstly. And then uh, we will discuss the story of the Nathan and Helen uh, in Poland. Uh, their names were Nachman and Hela Podróżnik. And this is why we published this book under these names. Uh, Nachman Podróżnik, not as uh, later in USA, uh, Nachman uh, was named. Uh, and uh, okay, so first the history of the diary, then the history of the Nathan and uh, Helen, and uh, the history of the whole family, uh, finally. Uh, so uh, this book, uh, Memoirs of uh, Nathan Drew, uh, Nachman Podróżnik, uh, is uh, a story about survival uh, of this 
attacked uh, people uh, under the Nazi occupation uh, during the Second World War. Uh, this uh, memoirs, uh, we will talk how it uh, how it starts and how it ends, but of course only not in detail because I want you to read this book. Uh, but uh, but it starts uh, before the war uh, in Wałomża city uh, in Poland, uh, and then. Uh, the most part of this diary uh, is uh, mm, it's, uh, uh, situated in uh, Warsaw. Uh, so uh, this is the frame, uh, and I think this is the moment to, to ask the first question uh, concerning the story of the diary itself. Uh, Professor Zbikowski, would you like to ask uh, the first question uh, about the story itself? and about the diary itself. Uh, hello, welcome everybody. Uh, I saw that we have about 30 participants of our meeting, so it's a great success of our edition house, small edition house, but very, very important. And Jerry, as I understand, uh, you, you were born uh, in the States after the war. Uh, what was the time when you first time you heard about your parents history in what you how you feel felt uh, at that time as you their history was always around us so i don't think there is a time when i was not aware of what had happened uh, my father spoke freely about the war, freely about uh, the events that are covered in the book. So I think I always knew them. I just came to understand them differently as I grew older. So, <clears throat> and uh, you think, uh, it's of course, it's absolutely sure that uh, this history very influence your life, uh, your wife's life, is your, also your history. And maybe you can uh, say uh, something if the history written in 40s different a bit for this in 80s or it's the same, it's the very original version of the narration. Um. Okay, so, but Jerry, just uh, a second, if I can uh, interrupt, uh, because I think that we had to explain to the audience uh, what is the structure uh, of the book and uh, what is the basis oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, of the book. Uh, so, uh, before uh, answering the question about the differences between the relation from 40s and 80s, please, Jerry, tell us uh, how this uh, memoirs, uh, how was it created? When was it created? Uh, why, Nathan, uh, why did Nathan decide, uh, decide to, to tell this uh, story? Uh, and what, uh, when uh, was it happened? When did it happen? Sorry. My father emigrated to the United States in 1946. According to the story that he always told, and my mother told, he was racked with nightmares and various trauma from the war. My mother believed that perhaps she, he could expurgate, he could get rid of some of this trauma if he were to sit down and write down what had occurred. So sometime in 1947, he began to dictate in Polish what would become the memoir. And my mother typed it in multiple copies. And of course, I still have a copy of that. Uh, basically, he kept on writing it into, I think, 1948, where the written copy ends literally in mid sentence. What occurred, I believe, is my father went into business and took his first business trip going to Mexico. Uh, he never returned to writing the manuscript after that. Many years later, uh, I began to do an oral history from him. And so we took the period that was happening before the beginning of the manuscript, and more importantly, the events that occurred after the manuscript, and he basically told me about them, and I recorded them and then transcribed what he had said. So, first time you read the, the manuscript in the 70s, 80s, 
Len. Well, I couldn't read the manuscript because it was written in Polish. And oh, the uh, manuscript, God. So the manuscript itself wasn't translated into English until the, until 2015. Now, my father oh, read it to me. My father did read it to me and translated it into English when he was reading it, obviously. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, uh, because it was uh, the, manus the written manuscript is uh, 40s, late 40s, and then the oral relation is uh, 80s. Uh, am I right? Uh, this is the timeline uh, where we are and now. And, uh, when, uh, you, uh, when you were uh, mm, discussing with your father uh, in the 80s, uh, this, uh, did uh, Nathan use uh, this uh, written memoir uh, from 40s to, to make uh, his memory stronger? Uh, was it uh, useful then or uh, contrary? Was it, uh, was it a problem to... Uh, to include this memories from the 40s in the uh, story from 80s. We know that memories become somewhat fixed in your mind at a certain point. When my father wrote his memoir in 1947, he fixed his thoughts and actually fixed the words that he would use. So later on, when he would speak extemporaneously about it, he would actually be using the same words that he had written some 40 years earlier. And the variation between what he had written and what he said was very, very minor. It became very fixed in his mind at that point and didn't really change. Yeah, but uh, the problem... Okay, please, uh, Professor Vygotsky, sorry. Yeah, the problem, but uh, the problem is that in 47, when your father dictated the memoirs, you know, he remembered you know, these facts and decided to put it in the paper. But in the 80s, maybe he, he remembered more about, uh, about uh, more people, more incidents. Uh, maybe it's possible to add something to his memory. You, you would expect that, but that's not what happened. I mean, except in minor details, when he began to recount the story in the 80s, it was almost exactly the same. Uh, he mm -hmm. did not. I mean, obviously, there were other things that happened or other things that were related. There are things that are not even in the book that I recall telling you about. But um, generally speaking, as I said, it was, to me, it was very odd how fixed his memory had become and how firmly he had stuck to the story, if you like, if I can put it that way. Mm -hmm. So uh, practically there was no difference between uh, the memories from 40s and 80s uh, besides the language, because the language has changed and I think it has it changed something, uh, however, uh, and uh, some minor details. Uh, mm, okay, and uh, the the change uh, of the language. Uh, mm, I, I know that he wasn't able to uh, to uh, mm, notice these differences between the narration in Polish and in English. Uh, so, uh, and we were not able as well because we are not native English. Mm, uh, speakers. So, uh, however, we uh, we could compare the uh, English uh, text that was published uh, in the uh, English American uh, edition uh, because we hadn't mentioned, uh, and we have to that uh, before the Polish edition uh, about which we are talking now, uh, there was an English uh, edition uh, published. Uh, to, uh, how, how many years ago? Two, uh, two three years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it was published, of course, uh, totally in English. The Polish uh, text uh, from 40s was translated, as Jerry said, to, to English in, in 2015. Uh, so, uh, of course, th there, there were some differences in the language. Uh, and the, um, I think this is the moment to ask uh, why uh, did you, Jerry, finally 
uh, decide to publish uh, your father's memoir in English uh, because it happens like uh, 20 years after this uh, story from 80s. Uh, well, both my father and mother had died by then, and I wanted my children and their children and the family to be able to read their experiences, and there was no way that was going to happen unless we translated into English. So it really started off as a family project and only found a, a, a wider audience later. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, so uh, I have uh, we have a thing. I think that we have to mention about one more person uh, in this project and in the process of writing down these memoirs, uh, because we haven't mentioned Helen uh, as a very important person here. Uh, could you, Jerry, tell us more about the about a role uh, about Helen's role in this process of writing down memoirs uh, of constructing this story? and constructed this very fixed story. Uh, and the one more question, if I uh, can ask, uh, it concerns the, uh, where is the voice of Helen? Uh, do you hear the voice of Helen in this memoir or someone else in the, uh, in the story that uh, is uh, talked in your family? Clearly my mother must have had some influence on how it was written down because she was physically typing it. But it's a good question to ask, do I hear my mother's voice? No, I very clearly hear my father's voice. Even in the English translation, uh, when I first read it, I was struck by how closely the translator had really captured my father's way of speaking, even though he was translating it from Polish into English. So I would have to say I did not hear my mother's voice in it. Mm-hmm. And they're all yet, uh, the, they're yet, all mm -hmm. she had she would hear virtually every moment of everything that occurred during the book. Mm -hmm. And during the writing down the memoirs in the 40s, because it was her who wrote down this memoir. So Maybe we can tell that this memory, which is in the book, is not only the memory of Nathan, but also the memory of Helen, of both of them, uh, maybe. Certainly she had to have had a role in forming the language that was used because she was physically the person putting it down on paper. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, so this is the story of, uh, of the diary of uh, two relations from 40s and 80s. Uh, in the Polish edition, uh, we decided to, uh, to use, uh, of course, the Polish Thai script from 40s as a basis uh, of the book, uh, because what was very important for us was, of course, the story itself, but also the language that Nathan and Helen used to uh, put uh, the, their experiences uh, into words. Uh, and we uh, we did uh, every effort to to keep as much as it was possible from the original language uh, from 40s. And uh, to this relation from 40s, we add some paragraphs, uh, some episodes uh, from uh, 80s. Uh, the challenge was to mix it uh, in one narration, uh, which. Uh, will be uh, easy to read and uh, interesting uh, and uh, fluent. Uh, the, this was uh, our goal uh, when we were preparing this book to, to make it uh, pleasant to read. Uh, and But at the same time, because these fragments from 80s and 40s, uh, from time to time, the they were, they were talking about the same event, but from two different perspectives, uh, we had to, um, we had to uh, um, make a difference between the narration from 40s and 80s, and we decided to, uh, to print a narration from 40s in black, 
uh, and the narration from 80s in the gray uh, to underline this uh, memory work because this is another topic uh, which we has discussed already but this is the topic of this book of this edition too uh, the mechanism of the memory of Nathan and Helen uh, too uh, mm, we can trace the some uh, some mechanism uh, of the memory here uh, and I think that the next big question which we would like to ask you Jerry uh, concerns in a way memory uh, and maybe person Zbikowski now would like to ask this uh, question no, my question is about because in, uh, in the memoirs of your father, the memoirs, the history happened in two, two or three fields. First of all, Womza, and I asked you yesterday how you spell Womza in New York, because it's not simple to spell in Polish Womza to L and Z. And also it's happened in Warsaw. The, they survived in Warsaw, thanks to their friends, to Democrats, to communists, to their skill, to your father's skill to, 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 to arrange always what's necessary and um, how you um, and when you understood that it's happened in two different places. Romsa is a small city, Augusto, Soviet occupation, also a small city, and also was the, the, the Polish capital under the occupation, absolutely different history, big ghettos, uh, a lot of dangers, and so on and so on. How for you? This two level of this narration is visible. I personally don't see a distinction between the narration depending upon the place that they're in. But I think one thing that is very interesting is how careful my father was to use location. In other words, when you read the memoir the first thing you notice first things i noticed is of course how careful he is about naming names and that has an obvious significance he knows that most of the people whose names he is naming died and very probably died without any surviving relatives who would even be able to attest to their existence a more difficult question was why was he so careful to name places and this was really suggested to me by um, Kira Schulman, who really worked on our uh, uh, the website that we have for the book. And she pointed out that it was a part of repopulating the areas with Jews and with people. In other words, just as the lives had been lost, so had the people's location in the areas been destroyed. And in a subconscious way, I think my father used location and used the preciseness of locations. Things always happen at the corner of this and that. He's walking down this street. He's going down that lane. It's in this number building. You know, he tells you the numbers of the buildings he's in. It's a matter of repopulating. It. So there's just some, some very interesting, I guess, psychological issues that go on in there. But go ahead, please. That's very interesting. <laughs> Sorry, there is one technical problem because I hear myself, but maybe I will continue. Okay, so. Um, oh, okay. Maybe it will work maybe better. Maybe we ask our audience to, to do something with, with, with microphone, to shut it down for a moment because it's the noise. Yeah, yeah, that's right. This uh, echo, I hear myself. Okay, uh, we'll continue. What uh, you have uh, said, Jerry, about this repopulation in the imagine, imagination and uh, in in a symbolic way, it's very interesting uh, and concerns uh, one more time uh, 
uh, memory work, uh, mechanism of memory, uh, how uh, it works. Uh, and uh, what uh, we think that maybe we, now we can uh, switch to, uh, to the question about, uh, because what is very interesting uh, for us here in Poland, of course, is uh, your parents' attitude and uh, your father's attitude uh, to Poland uh, after the war. Uh, how was Poland present uh, uh, in your life and the Womja, of course, because as person Zbikowski said, Womja is so important here in this uh, memoir and so uh, very precisely described, uh, as you said, every street, every building, numbers of houses, it's impressive. It's really impressive. If and I could add something, okay, uh, your, father, your father was the man very known in Womza, personally, very known for mm -hmm. like uh, uh, engineer and so on, very influent man, very good known. In Warsaw, he was in a hideout, he was no, um, he looked like Paul, uh, and so this difference is very important. I think that for him, the Womza people, Womza society was something more important than this short episode in Warsaw, in, in hiding. Yeah, um, let me first of all hit the questions in two parts, starting with your question about how did he feel about being Polish. And my father was very proudly Polish. It was very, it's very interesting. He would like always, New York City, we have two highways that are named after Polish heroes, Pulaski and Kosciuszko, which we all call in New York. Kosciuszko, and my father would go, oh my goodness, that's, those Americans, that's Kosciuszko, not the Kosciuszko Bridge. And he was very proud of all these kinds of memories. And he would say, oh my goodness, you know, Americans owed their freedom to these Polish heroes who came over. And so he had this very, very strong Polish identity. And that was reinforced during the war because Polish people were really the key to his survival. In other words, many, many Christian Poles knew him when he was walking the streets of Warsaw. And any one of them could have denounced him, but they protected him. So because of that, he had a very, very warm feeling for the Polish people. After the war beginning in 1964, he began to return annually to Poland to spend two weeks there with his comrades. Uh, from the war as long as they were still alive, and this lasted around to 2000 or so, like 1990s. He would still go back every year, meet with them, sometimes meet with their children if they had already passed. But he felt a very, very strong connection. The second question of Lomja is also really interesting. Um, a lot of Jews from Poland emigrated to the United States. When they came to the United States, and at this I think they are no different than Pol Polish Poles who came to the United States, they remembered their heritage and formed groups, mutual aid societies. For example, in New York City, there was a Wamja Mutual Aid Society, and it had a dinner every year, and it took care of the elderly. It had a cemetery, it has a cemetery. Uh, and they, one of the most important things that they actually did was by a large cemetery plot where the people from that town could be buried among their neighbors. Uh, I always feel bad. I go back and visit the cemetery uh, at least every year. And I always feel bad that my father's not there with me because he would have been able to tell me who everybody was. My father was one of those kind of people who knew everybody and remembered everybody's story. So he would have gone through everybody's tombstone and told you who they were and what they were and their stories and who had been with other people. It would, it would have been very interesting. And, um, and as just, just as a further aside, my father was the kind of person, he was there actually very late, but somehow he paid off somebody in the cemetery thing because his, his and my mother's gravestones are right up front, even though he was a late comer. So he always knew how to get things that he wanted. Um, okay. 
Oh, one more time, I hear my voice uh, tripled, etc. But okay, <laughs> I hope that uh, I can continue. Uh, the, the, what what we would like to ask you more is this uh, Wamjer at society, uh, because it's I think it's a very interesting phenomenon and not so very well known here in Poland. Uh, it's the question to Professor Zbikowski if there are any uh, books on this kind of uh, societies in the United States, uh, societies that uh, united uh, people uh, from cities in Poland. But uh, Jerry, could you tell us more about this society? Uh, how... Uh, how uh, um, how did it work? Uh, how was uh, what was the main uh, goal of the society? Uh, how these people were connected? Uh, in which way? Uh, what was this ad that is in the uh, name of the society? Uh, financial or other? Uh, please tell us more about this uh, Wonder Ad Society in New York. I don't know a tremendous amount about it, but I know that the societies were formed for mutual help and aid. In other words, when you came to America, the Lumge Aid Society probably went back to the turn of the 20th century, that is to say 1900. You came as a stranger to a country and you needed help with your settlement. You needed people that would give you a job. You needed people that would find you a doctor, find you a place to live. And each of the towns in and I won't say that I imagine the Italians have the same thing. Each of the towns would set up their own little organization whose job it was to take care of the newly arriving immigrants, to provide them with care from birth to death, basically speaking. There were hospitals, there were doctors. Uh, many, all of them had cemetery plots. Uh, and so the idea was to provide some sort of transitional help group now, it basically did not go beyond the first generation. In other words, the children of the people that had been immigrants basically became Americans and did not see themselves as being part of the aid society. But it existed for that transitional group that had come over. Mm -hmm. Mm, and uh, did you participate uh, in these meetings? Uh, no. In... No, no. 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 No, I'm not even sure to the extent that my father participated in the meetings. Mm -hmm. He was not a big organization man. I mean, he went to the annual dinner because it was an opportunity to see all these people that he knew and he probably knew who everybody was, you know. And, and you know, they had many relatives who had come from... Lamja. Both my mother's family was from there and his family was from there. So there were numerous, numerous people, cousins, distant cousins and distant, distant cousins and people who claimed to be cousins but probably weren't. Uh, you know, there was just a whole extended group of people and all of them were from the same little town. Mm -hmm. It was amazing. It seemed to me growing up that there were more people in the United States uh, from Lumsia that they probably weren't actually in the town. Yeah, but uh, as I could uh, add some question, it was organized uh, like a religious life, you know, yeshiva or a synagogue or uh, Jewish uh, festivals or so on? No, no, it was not. It didn't have a strong religious component. It, it was not a religious organization. It was more a social organization. Uh, that I'm very sure of. It did not. Very work. interesting. Yeah, well, well, you know, many of the people were secular. Secular. You know, many yeah. of the people mm -hmm. that come over were not particularly religious, and the organization was aimed at dealing with all of them. I always had the impression that basically when they got together it was for a big party. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, they just enjoyed getting together. They would pull out the bottles of vodka and they would like uh, celebrate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, start but singing old, you start but singing old songs in Polish. But you never been in Poland, or you visit Poland? I visited Poland three or four times. 
Ah, fine. So, how do you find Poland compared to your fam uh, your father uh, region? Remember? Well, first time I went to Poland was in I don't know, it was in the 1970s. Probably around. Oh, it was 1960s. Excuse me. It was 1964. We went over, and um, it, my my mother was very much against it. Um, one of the stories that you read in the book is how my father swears allegiance to the Communist Party, mm -hmm. and for reasons I think modern people don't even understand, he took that oath very seriously, and he felt, in a certain sense, that he had betrayed. The party by leaving for America. He had been offered a position in the government uh, in 1945, and he decided to go to Germany to refugee camp, and then eventually go to America. And so he was very nervous about going back. He wondered out loud whether or not he would be allowed to be re returned to the United States, which of course wasn't much of an issue because he was an American citizen at the time. But he felt this conflict of the fact that, in a certain sense, he had betrayed his loyalty to his comrades, to the party, to all of these things that he had taken an oath to defend. They took the oath very, very seriously. So we went back. Poland was still under Stalinism. It was, it was when Stalin was long dead, but it was still a very cold and dark place. Sure, sure, yeah. You know better than I would know. But yeah. you were struck as, as a Westerner coming into Warsaw. How primitive it was in many ways compared to the United States. We went to Lumja. Um, we drove there. It was like you know, it's a distance in miles, about ninety miles. It probably took us about four hours because yeah, yeah, yeah. the roads yeah. weren't very good. We arrived there, and the town was very poor. Uh, some of them, my mother, my father took me to a house he had lived in, and they still had outhouses which for an American was like something that I had actually only heard of, you know, mm -hmm. but, uh, but they were still using outhouses in the middle of the area. I crossed my legs and waited till I got back to uh, Warsaw because I was a little you know, nervous about using them and found people that he knew. He walked the streets. He went into the houses. One of the important moments of his life was the death of his brother from tuberculosis in the 1930s. He went and found the house where his brother had died, and we knocked on the door, and these very bewildered people opened the door. My father explained mm -hmm. that he had lived there before the war and wanted to see the room where his brother had died. My mother took me to her school where she had gone to grade school, and we walked around the hallways together. Um, we saw the movie theater that my grandfather had owned. We walked the streets. We saw where their homes had been. They had been destroyed during the war. But rebuilt. Uh, so we did all those kinds of things. Uh, met people he knew, still knew a lot of the Polish people. That he knew. So it was, a, it was a very interesting trip in that sense. And of course, in Warsaw, there were so many of his friends. You know, they would get together. There would be 20 or 30 people in a room. You know, and he, and he, as I said, after that, he went back very frequently. Yeah, very interesting. It's your history. Yes, it, it changed a lot, of course, from uh, that time. But uh, yeah, yeah, I hear also the eco, eco something is not good for with Anya. Sounds good on my side. Yeah, my. You're clear. <laughs> Your uh, your voice, Jerry, is very clear. There is some problem right. between our uh, computers. Uh, Magda advised me to put uh, earphones, uh, but I don't know if it works better. But please continue, Professor Zbikowski. We have to. No, no, it's not the problem. I have only one um, small remark. But for us, uh, your father testimony or your father diary is like a diary. It's written. Absolutely, in the first years after the war, when the memory was very vivid, and for us, we, it's like a document. And your history, the other part is also, the, as Anya mentioned, a kind of um, information what's happened with memory. Yeah. And, uh, that there are a lot of nostalgia 
in your life also in Polish diaspora, also in Polish Jewish diaspora, and we should still uh, be in touch. No? <laughs> Visit. You see, it's impossible, but uh, maybe next year you you come to also, and we could present you to our audience, to our students uh, or participants to, 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 to repeat your history, uh, the history of your family, of course. It's very, nowadays it's a very interesting how um, it's a lot of time passed and um, not all could imagine how the people lived before the war. It's uh, also a lot of very interesting, very fine photos in our edition. Maybe yeah. Anya and maybe later show the audience how very nice the, the, the book. Yeah. And again, it's, it's remarkable that so many of the photographs survived. Oh, now, yeah. the photographs from before the war are very easy to explain because my father had a sister in the United States. My mother had three aunts. So the photographs were going back and forth between the people. The photographs taken during the war are harder to explain their existence. And people just took pictures. And, you know, we think of, we, th we sometimes forget that people are living ordinary lives, oh, even yeah. in the midst of the Nazi occupation that my Parents are going to bars and restaurants and to concerts and sitting out uh, in, in the parks working on their suntans. And there is an ordinary life that's going on, and so the picture is somewhat to document the fact that that is happening. Uh, that's right. Maybe we can show now uh, some of these pictures. Uh, we will start with a picture showing uh, the books that has been published. Uh, and uh, what I would like to show you especially, uh, okay, uh, just give me a second, okay. Um, I, this is uh, the oh, book that has, this, that has been published uh, already. Uh, Mm, and here uh, we have uh, the picture showing how this uh, photography gallery uh, is uh, situated in the book. Uh, this is the original tie script of the memoir in Polish from 40s. You can see from with, with uh, what kind of the text we had to work uh, at the beginning of uh, editing our book. Uh, we had to read this uh, type script and uh, then uh, edit it uh, in uh, some way to, to make it uh, readable uh, for uh, the modern audience. Uh, and here we have this uh, family uh, photos uh, from your Jerry uh, family collection. Uh, this is the family of uh, Nathan. Uh, the Nathan is, I don't know if I can show you. Uh, do you see the, this is the Nathan. Uh, am I right, Jerry? Uh, yes, yes. The old boy uh, in the first room. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, this is the whole family of the uh, Podróżnik. Uh, here we have uh, Helen's uh, father and mother uh, in the 30s. Uh, and uh, here, this is the Nathan as a teenager uh, himself, uh, here with his brother, uh, who you, Jerry, has had, uh, have, you have mentioned uh, Abraham. Uh, they both were, uh, they both attended the Polish uh, school for teachers. Uh, was, am I right, Jerry? This is uh, the story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, and, uh, and here we have Helen uh, in some summer no, no. situation. No. Helen with uh, his sister Ruth. Uh, then other um, uh, documents that we have, and uh, I know that this is another story, but uh, we can only mention now uh, that uh, uh, you have, your family uh, has uh, another uh, extra uh, document uh, which are the letters written from for, uh, written for, uh, by Helen to Ruth. 
Uh, and uh, can you tell us, uh, Jerry, a little bit more about these letters? Because I know this is uh, quite a new uh, discovery uh, of your family history. Yes. Um, my mother had an older sister, and that's not her, by the way. I don't know who that is. It's not uh -huh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Anyway, my mother had an older sister who had gone to medical school in uh, Belgium, in Liège starting in 1932, she married a Catholic man and they moved to the Belgian Congo where they became doctors. I was going to say medical missionaries, but they were not really missionaries. They became doctors with a plantation outside of what used to be called Stanleyville. So they began to extend a, uh, matter of fact, if you look at the envelope that's right up there, it tells you it's going to the Congo and you don't need an address. Because all you have to do is mention the person's name and it will get there. Um, but so beginning in 1938, when they moved, they began to correspond. And they corresponded for as long as they were possible during the war. And then after the war, when my parents came to America, they continued to correspond. So we have no real idea of yet, because they haven't been translated, what they are. Part of it's written in French, part of it's written in English, part of it's written in Polish. I mean, they use sort of all of the different languages. Polish. Yeah, a lot in Polish, some in Yiddish. Uh, there are some parts that are in French. Uh, my mother read French. And so it's uh, something that will be very interesting to find out uh, what they were saying to each other. And again, it's another contemporaneous record of what was occurring. My mother is writing them in the beginning of the war when they're under Soviet occupation under German occupation too, I believe. But we'll, we'll be looking forward to finding out what they were saying to each other in these letters. Hmm. Uh, that's a big um, challenge. Uh, and I know that uh, there is a team who works on this letter. Uh, and I hope that uh, we will see uh, the translation soon and uh, the um, whole uh, letters uh, edited uh, to uh, to be able to read uh, them and uh, and uh, um, know how was it uh, how what was the story in this letter? Uh, okay, so uh, first Bikowski, do you want to add something now? Uh, and no, I only like to add that it's uh, for me, it was very, very interesting. Maybe I was very... Um, at first, I'm not sure how very assimilated your family into Polish, Polishness, your, uh, your, fa your parents were. So, it was very dangerous, very, very... Um, to hide out in the war, so during the war, maybe it's something interesting in the in this group uh, of friends with uh, whom uh, he, he take uh, no, he has a relation. Uh, this mention in the uh, memoirs, uh, Fredek. It was uh, no, Yaroshevich Alfred. Uh, the, maybe also his lot after the war, he was in prison, he was, yeah, <clears throat> he was known like uh, used by the communist regime during the, the, the process against Gomułka and Spekalski. Maybe it influenced the, the, and your father stands towards the communist regime because the, 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 the Stalinist communists, they you know, battle or they put to prison to prisons the uh, their colleagues, yeah, Democrats. Um, if you'll remember, in the, towards the end of the book, he jumps from the train with a Polish yeah. man in Geniak. And Geniak was a, the only committed communist among the group, and he later became a colonel in the. Uh, Polish secret police. No, and okay. he's the only one of the comrades that my father would never talk to after the war because he felt that he had, he, he knew that he had denounced 
all of their other mm-hmm. friends as in being insufficiently uh, doctrinaire and caused them to go to prison. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. You know, uh, for us, it's a very interesting story because, uh, you know, uh, no, some of uh, Polish Jews survivors of the war <coughs> uh, was to were in touch with the communist regime. Yeah. Bergman, others means you know, very, very important politicians were Jewish origin, like a communist before war communist. It was a very complicated story, but um, very interesting. How the people, which uh, way the people take to. If you would go back a picture, uh, go back to the one before that, this is really something very interesting. This is, of course, in Warsaw. The Warsaw, and the, and the picture is dated in the back. I don't know who dated it. But when I look at this picture, you can begin to understand how they were able to survive openly. Here they are. This is May of 1944. The Russians are almost at the gates of Warsaw. Uh, repression is going on all over. And here are two people that are basically dressed to the nines. They're dressed like they're going to a show or an opera, looking so confident that how would anybody suspect them to be to hidden be Jews? You know, they had that sort of look of confidence that is very striking for the period that they're walking within. That's right. Uh, and uh, I think the, maybe the last question before we uh, we let uh, our audience uh, to uh, ask uh, the questions, because I see that uh, there are a lot of uh, questions from questions from the audience. Uh, because, uh, but maybe the last uh, last question uh, will concern uh, documents, because uh, and uh, for this false documents and uh, this false identities because the book and the memoirs uh, are in part of uh, uh, of changing identities all the time because Nathan uh, had to change and Helen too uh, had to change their identities uh, through the war uh, for the for the war uh, during the war and uh, this is the question uh, to you and to Professor Zbikowski as well uh, because here uh, on the uh, on the picture you can see uh, two false documents uh, uh, of Nathan and Helen, but with other name, of course. The name here is Andrzej Czak, uh, mm-hmm. but we know that Nathan uh, had uh, much more false documents and much more uh, names, other names uh, and identities. Uh, but shortly, can you tell us, Professor Zbikowski, and uh, maybe you, Jerry, too, uh, how uh, did this work, uh, this system of false document? Uh, who was uh, engaged uh, in it? Uh, how was it possible at all uh, to produce this uh, false documents? Yeah, no, of course, the underground press offices and so on. But I think that um, Nathan was involved in the uh, underground activity, communist or socialist and leftist socialist activities. Uh, thanks to his friends, uh, no, he was maybe no, not so very, very hard to 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 organize because it's it was the very long history to organize the so-called matrica matriculum uh, from the church for example after uh, it was necessary to go to the german office polish german office to 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 take the king carta so-called you know passport or something like that and after you need you have to need the the, the paper that you are employed somewhere or you know in the woman uh, no, no, for the woman it was necessary but for the men of course absolutely and after there was something registration uh, that you lived somewhere yeah it's a, it was a very very complicated history and um, I think about no, it, it cost a lot. Not uh, always uh, was enough the, the the help of the friends. Uh, 
are very friends. No, no I, I, my, my father actually sold them. He was he was that's how they supported themselves during the war, and he was basically a go between people that wanted to get false documents and the people that actually manufactured them. What he was particularly proud of is that his false documents were real false documents, as he used to say. Mm, really false. What they would do is they would find a sympathetic churchman, because the church kept the birth and death records, and the death record of someone who was close to your age would be destroyed. And so, as my father would put it, that person now became alive. And if anybody checked the validity of your documents, they could go back to the church and check your birth record and, check and see that you were actually a real person. And so he was particularly proud of these documents that he made. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is uh, the way uh, they managed to, to, to produce this very uh, real false documents so this is uh, quite complicated but it it goes uh, like that uh, so maybe this is the time to uh, to let uh, ask uh, the audience uh, let audience uh, ask questions uh, i think that okay we see magda uh, who will uh, help us uh, and read uh, the questions uh, from the audience Uh, so we have first comment and a uh, question from Kathy that she, she says that thank you to our family in Israel, France, Belgium and the USA for joining this presentation. And Jerry, can you please share when Helen and Nathan came to the first Wamja Society event in America and people could not believe they had survived and that Aunt Ruth did not know that Helen had survived and the letters. Yes, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, my first cousin, um, if Ruth's daughter, was named after my mother because they had assumed that she had perished during the war and was named after her. Okay, uh, so we have we have question. another question. Uh, Elżbieta Cywiak asks, what definitely decided not to emigrate to America if he felt so much attached to Poland and was in favor of the Communist Party? It was my mother's decision. Um, my mother did not want to stay in Poland after the war. Uh, she told me later she felt it was inhabited by too many ghosts. And she felt, they knew, of course, by 1945-46, that Poland was going to come under communist rule. And she felt she did not want to stay, despite the fact that her father was offered an office in the communist rule, and so she really made the decision. Uh, my, my father always claimed, whether true or false, that he would have stayed if it had been up to him. And then they came to America because, because simply because they had so many relatives here. Okay. Okay, Elliot Rosen says the point that Jerry made about the translator keeping the voice of his father is very important. The flavor, the ca cadence and the uniqueness of a person's voice is an important part of a successful translation. So this is a comment to the, um, to the um, talk. Uh, we I, have think another... I think that's very true, by the way. And... Uh... Uh, it, it, one of the choices that I made when we were doing the translation was not to correct anything. In other words, to try and stay as closely to everything he had written, even if it was ungra ungrammatical or awkward, and not to try and fix it. Because I felt it was very important that people hear his voice 
rather than that of a historian or somebody who's fixing up the memoir. Okay. Uh, Katarzyna uh, asks, did your father tell you about his life in Wormsa before the war? Did anything special stick in your memory? Any places or people? Yes, he, he spoke at length about uh, his time before the war. He uh, uh, it'd been a, he'd considered to be a very happy time. Uh, he was an ex actually an excellent athlete and played on the town's basketball team and soccer, what you call football team. So he would talk about sports and he would talk about the people he played with on their teams. And my grandparents, my mother's parents, were very prominent people within the town. So they, they spoke about it all the time and they uh, talked about the places they had been and the coffee shops and uh, the properties and all those various things. So he was, he was not reticent about it time before the war and they remembered it as, as as a privileged time because they were in many ways privileged people. Okay and here's uh, a, com a commentary to the one of the first questions uh, why did you uh, decide to translate it into English and I let I don't know if I pronounce it correctly uh, said that the book in English made it possible for us to learn what Nat and Helen went through. Mm -hmm. And we have another um, question, I think, to, to Anna. Uh, let me just... Are there plans in the uh, Jewish Historical Institute for publishing other testimonies from the Holocaust period? maybe some diaries from small provincial towns. Okay, I switch on my microphone and, uh, and okay, I can answer now. Uh, this is the moment when we would like to mention and uh, that the book, uh, the Counterfeit Poles uh, in Polish, uh, was published in the book series, uh, which was named uh, uh, accounts, uh, the memoirs, accounts, uh, and diaries before, and now the uh, the new name and the new layout uh, of the series is uh, accounts and relations uh, or memoirs uh, and relations, uh, and uh, of course we have plans to to publish another another uh, memoirs uh, from the war period uh, about the Holocaust. And uh, here uh, on the picture, you have uh, recent uh, and uh, uh, other uh, books that were published in this book series. Uh, we had a very important uh, position here in this book series. I think that Professor Zbikowski uh, can say more about uh, this earlier uh, books published in this uh, in this series. Uh, but uh, for the next year, uh, we plan uh, to publish uh, relations and memoirs uh, concerning uh, little towns uh, in Poland uh, like uh, Tomaszów Mazowiecki uh, in the relation uh, of the Regina Margies Czernow uh, who will who will tell uh, who will um, who will present uh, the story of the city during the war and uh, uh, her own uh, story uh, related to the city uh, and uh, another uh, another book uh, that uh, will uh, tell the story of Warsaw uh, uh, on the other hand. So for the next year we plan uh, the book uh, about uh, Tomasz Mazowiecki, the small city, and another book uh, about the uh, story of uh, another story of survival in uh, Warsaw. Uh, so this is uh, this is the plan for the 2021 in this uh, book uh, series. Uh, I don't know, do you want to add something, Professor Zbikowski, about this book series and earlier books uh, that we have published? No, no, we have not enough time to, 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 to talk about all these books. The common thing is that uh, there are the memoirs of the survivors. And uh, who stay 
in Poland a few years, you know, mostly up to 60s or late 40s, late 50s, and after they emigrated. So for us, it was very interesting, not only what's happened with them during the war, but also how the first years after the war, the same like uh, by uh, Nat, uh, what uh, decided that they emigrated, fear or um, they didn't uh, like to live on the cemetery, cemetery or so. It's a very, very important history, but the, is the multi voices history, so it's impossible to to, to find the one trace, uh, one idea. Only the memoirs of survivors and uh, simple people, very important, influenced people, or very different people uh, wrote their memoirs after the war and after they decided that we, Jewish Historical Institute, should uh, publish their, uh, no, their diaries or memoirs. It's two. And of course we um, invite uh, all the families, members of families of survivors to, to, to call us or to send the mail, to offer something, collaboration, if they have you know, something very, so important like the, the, the memoirs of Podróżnik. So we are very open for uh, your initiative and like to show the Polish audience you know, uh, what's happened and uh, that we all the time we think about it, about the, the Polish Jewish history before and during the war and of course after the war. Thanks. Okay. Magda, do we have any other question from the audience? Uh, no, uh, no, we, we don't have. Okay, so uh, so now I think that uh, because it's only the short presentation of the book, and I think that uh, when uh, there's uh, quite a crazy situation with uh, lockdown, uh, and uh, and uh, we will meet uh, in person, and uh, we will be able to organize uh, mm -hmm. a meeting, uh, one more meeting with Jerry Drew and Kathy Drew uh, here in Warsaw and maybe in Womja and uh, one more time uh, discuss another details uh, from this very uh, interesting and impressive uh, story. Um, mm -hmm. Jerry, maybe you want to add something uh, at the end uh, of our meeting? Well, I just want to add my thanks to all of you for the work you're doing in publishing uh, the memoir. And of course, my thanks for having me on. And also my thanks to everybody who was listening today and everybody who tuned in to hear us talk. So thank you to everybody. Thank you, thank you, Jerry, uh, for for all the stories and uh, for for your uh, father's uh, memoirs that we were uh, glad uh, and we had honor to to publish uh, in the uh, Jewish Historical Institute uh, Press. Uh, the last thing I would like to uh, say is uh, just uh, about uh, where we. Could, uh, where you can uh, buy uh, this Polish edition. Uh, we have a paper book, uh, as you see, uh, and uh, an electronic version uh, is also available. Uh, the, I think the easiest way to, to buy a book now uh, in the lockdown situation is through the uh, website of no, our yeah. uh, bookstore. Uh, here you have uh, the, uh, the website uh, address of our bookstore. Uh, and if you have any uh, question concerning uh, the portraits, uh, please contact the bookstore uh, directly. Uh, so thank you so much once again, Jerry. Thank you very much. We hope that we will see you in person next year. And thank you, Professor Zbikowski, for the much. And of course, uh, Magda, we Magda Szyszkowska, we will 
for the organization uh, of this meeting uh, and it's not so easy situation when we can when we have to uh, connect uh, for the uh, for the uh, internet uh, so one more time thank you uh, all of you and thank you to the audience uh, for for the participation too thank you very much and see you soon i hope Thank you. See you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.